Now that could be due to much better teaching, could be due to much better students, uh, but you know, you sometimes have to ask questions about what we do mean by student success, and I think, I think most people think of it as the grade that they get at the end of the day, and all the rest is kind of soft talk, as we might say. Why does it? Thank you very much. Yeah, so the thing recently about the great inflation, and um, you know, they're, they're, yeah, they're complaining because they're getting too many firsts. I was like, can we ever win? <laughs> you know, you start, so you're concentrating on teaching, you're concentrating on effective curriculum, you're concentrating on all this stuff to help students do better. And then students start doing better and they start complaining that we're not trying hard enough. You just have to ask sometimes, is failure no longer an option? Does everybody have to pass? Absolutely. Is, is failure an aspect of student success? Is helping students to deal with failure, to learn from failure? What we mean by student success match what students mean by student success? What we mean, what we match mean what, what students mean. So what we mean as institutional educators, we have a certain view of what student success is, but do students agree with that view? Do they have a completely different view or sense of what student success is? And you know, sometimes I wonder, are we are we pushing our view and our perspectives? Are we going down the wrong path without actually maybe helping them achieve what they think student success? And what's your sense? Do you think they're different? What what a student definition of success is it different from ours? I don't think I'd have to answer it. Just put it out there. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants, to, who wants to answer it? I didn't want to answer Francis's point, but I would think student success is that the students feel that what they were doing, whether it was a module or the overall course, that it was worth doing. You know, no more than ourselves here. If we go home, you know, at lunchtime thinking, well, that was three days well spent on a beautiful sunny week, you know, when we're kind of coming to the end of the year. And it's the same with the students, you know, do they feel it was worth taking that subject or did I just do it because it was easy to get a high mark or it's the one that's most transferable when you go into the workplace and the same with the courses and I think a big issue is you know the increasing number of courses that are available to students and I often chat to students and some of this would be socially where they didn't really kind of you know want strongly to do that course but it's appropriate or it's in a broad area you know, so I think that's really where the issue is. Is it something that people feel afterwards was worth their while? Thank you very much. And I suppose there's like a, a, another aspect to that as well, is, is the different thing, like the rings on a tree. You know, did I think it was worthwhile immediately afterwards? Did I think it was worthwhile a year afterwards? I think it was worthwhile five years afterwards, and who knows? <laughs> It's okay, I'm okay. Um, but just to think of, you know, what student success, what, how we can define that, you know, as you say, there are a number of different stakeholders that are part of the process in order to achieve what we call student success. So it's not just about what the student hates, which I think is inherently important, the mix of the qual and the quant, also the lecturer, because we come at it from a different perspective, but also then society and industry, particularly, and how they view student success to be. We undertook a very interesting exercise in hospitality and tourism recently as we're going through school and programmatic review at the moment, which is very, very interesting. We were led by somebody who, who, who's recently joined and it's been very dynamic. But again, we looked at graduate attributes and interestingly, we here you are, I know it's not the same, but again, there was huge gaps as to what they perceived as being important and what we perceived as being important, you know? And I think it's a very interesting exercise to do that. And then you have to put a stir it in a pot and see, well, what do we really want and what do we really mean? Is it a mix of the grades? Because I agree, a lot of the students look for the two ones and the firsts, you know? So do industry, but industry sometimes looking more complex than that as well. It's about communication, it's about resilience, it's about being able to work as a team, you know? So there's a lot of different parameters we need to take into account. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, no, I think to paraphrase Albert Einstein, everything that counts or everything that we can count does not always count, and everything that we can count does not, you know, yeah. does not matter as well. And that's the thing. I think sometimes we count certain things because they're easy to count, and therefore, in everybody's mind, they seem to attract a weight that they don't actually deserve. And I suppose that's one of the attractions about grades, because they are a quantitative, uh, identifiable thing like that. And as I said, in Britain there, as I said, the number of two ones, of course, but they're now increasingly customers, because someone's paying £9,000 per year. And I, I, I quite agree that, as I said, like, it's what you do with those tools. And I think that um, certainly as senior management in institutions, they're going to conflate success with a very narrow definition. And that's what I said, I, I think the genius out of the bottom, I think, with, with the learning analytics. Um, I don't know, I, I haven't 
lads or anything, or just maybe muddy the waters a little bit more? Well, you've actually, what you've done very nicely is segue onto the next question, so thank you very much, I appreciate that. <laughs> All models are wrong, but some are useful. Not, yeah. Um, the, 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 what, what we have to measure may not be measuring what we think or what we wanted to measure. Um, I heard a, a fantastic story on, on data usage. I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to be the one talking, but anyway, I got the microphone. <laughs> um, a fantastic um, example of, of, of data misinterpretation. There was a hospital in the States some years ago brought in these consultants to look at all of their KPIs and, and you manage it, you know, where the, 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 the issues and where are the opportunities. And the consultants were delighted with themselves because they looked at all the data, they looked at patient fatalities, and they found one um, anaesthetist with soaring fatality rates. And they went down, yes, we've earned our money, fire this guy, there you go, the data says, let him go. And they brought it down to the, the hospital management, and the hospital management went, oh yeah, he's our best anaesthetist. And the reason he gets all the fatalities is because he's the best, he gets all the really, really hard cases. So, sorry, I've, 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 I've robbed your thunder. <laughs> what assumptions do we need to be careful about making? Counting isn't measuring. Counting isn't measuring, yeah. And measuring isn't necessarily understanding. Muttering over there. No, I was just saying, I just said why or how, but you, you also mentioned earlier on about um, just going back to the success of students and it's something that you were saying about the analytics, finding out, you know, whether it's attendance or whatever, mm -hmm. there needs to be a huge emphasis on student well-being because everybody is so, so busy. It does boil down to marks or numbers or grades, but then if you were to look at your analytics, so let's say attendance, and find out why they're not coming in. So I think there's a huge responsibility for just more than getting their grades up for achievement. Which again, actually, I'm gonna keep pushing on if you don't mind, because you've also segued beautifully. Thank you very much. I promise these people aren't planets. <coughs> And I think this is a major challenge. If, if we imagine a world where we can answer all of the questions and we can tell students exactly what resources to use, when, how much, how frequently, is that a good thing? Where do we draw the line? I think that's a good point. One of the first speakers, I don't, I don't know, you know, on the first day, one of the points were highlighted in relation to generation there, was that they're now not mature until they're about 24. And you know, the helicopter parent syndrome carries through to the third level where you get parents ringing you up saying, you know, how's my dog doing or whatever it is. Now, when I was going to college, the parents were distant, like well away from you. They didn't want to see your parents, they didn't want to know them. But I think that as a society we've moved to the stage now where, where parenting goes right on with maybe to the 30s and mid 30s in some instances. Um, I think it's a problem. I think resilience is a big problem. Thank you very much. So I teach psychology, and obviously this would be an issue that would come up quite a lot with us. And I often think our students should get two degrees anyway: a degree in psychology and a degree in personal development, because they have to learn a lot, <coughs> excuse me, about themselves along the way. But this is a very important issue because, for me, I think student success is about empowering them to be at that stage in their lives when they can launch. I think that's for me what student success is. I think that um, so some of this conversation about data, I, like, I, I think we're in danger of taking the data that we find and talking to ourselves about it. So it touches back to your point about it. I mean, what, what are we, so what are we asking students to do? Where have they come from and where are they going next? So success isn't just based on what they achieve, based on the criteria we've set them. It's based on what can they do afterwards. So we have to involve employers, the future careers. So for example, I work in the Institute of Education. Somebody could come out with a first and be a terrible teacher, but do I know that they're a terrible teacher? So I think data and data analytics enables us to have conversations, but who are we having those conversations with? So unless we're having them with other people that our students go on into the workforce and to a certain extent where they've come from, so second level, 
like what's, how does that system feed into each other? I think we're in danger of just talking to ourselves about stuff. Like you've said, we already know we have Excel sheets that monitor attendance. We already know that students who don't come to college are more likely to fail. We are, you know, we, we know a lot of this stuff. So it's what are we going to do with the data and who are we going to talk to about it? That's really what I think is. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So one of the uh, things that we are trying next year at Purdue uh, is part of a broad data science initiative, and it's uh, primarily a, a group of uh, somewhere between 300 and 700 students that are going to be a part of a learning community and learn how to work with big data. And they'll have these little cohorts of 25, and they'll answer questions. Some will be on dark matter, and they'll have a dark matter expert, and they'll look at data. Um, but one of the cohorts is going to be on institutional data and diversity. So we're actually asking the students to become aware of the institutional data that, that we have that we can use and then have them create research questions that might be answerable and actionable and then find out how we might use that data. So getting that student voice was something that was convenient because we had this set up, but I think it can be a nice way of allaying some of those concerns about who we're talking to if you have it in your capacity to involve the students directly in that process, either through undergraduate work study or class directly, um, the, the early pilot of this went really, really well. And we had a couple people that just went gangbusters and found things on uh, um, pipelines and where the students were before based on zip code data and all kinds of stuff, postal code data. So th those are things that you might consider. Thank you very much. Uh, which also opens up like a, a conversation we were having earlier uh, this morning before coming in. Um, you know, the opportunity in providing data to students to help them develop the skill of getting accustomed to working with data. You know, increasingly we're told data is the new oil, blah, blah, blah. Possibly in five years, oil will be the new oil. Um, but, you know, it, the, the ability to interpret and to understand both our data and how it's used is probably an increasingly extremely valuable asset. To have. So maybe this is also an opportunity to, to develop that, that ability. Sorry, just come back to, are you suggesting then the fact that students might access, or you may give students the retention data, for example, obviously it's really all anonymized, you know, and the fact that they work with that, and then their learning from that would impact on themselves and their own, you know, engagement with the university or college. I mean, I suppose conceivably, if, if it's done in a way that is, is appropriately anonymized yeah. and compatible yeah. with GDPR, what I meant was giving students access to their own data oh, yeah. so that they can they can see what, what we can see as well. But I think, yeah, I mean, there's always tremendous value in that. One, one beautiful symbiosis, um, you know, we have institutions and lecturers looking to crunch all of this data. And in so many institutions, we have students doing masters in data analytics and masters in business analytics who are looking for real world data to crunch. Mm -hmm. there, there is, a, again, a potentially beautiful relationship, assuming that it's done ethically and legally and in a way that is compatible with best practice. The, the, there is a, 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 a situation in there in which everyone can win. We might just run on to the last one. I'll try and get you out at least 30 seconds early. So this one is kind of a, a teaser, because I don't know what the right, right answer is. Imagine you are responsible for liaising between what the data finds and the interventions with students. Right? Imagine you look at the data and you see we have 200 students who are quantifiably less engaged. We have 200 students who we know are at risk. But you only have resources either to make a very light touch intervention for all 200 or to have a really meaningful impact on 40 students. What do you do? And if you go for the 40 students, how do you pick the 40 students you're going to intervene with? This is hypothetical, but... I probably this is a kind of optimization problem where it depends should depend upon the op, op, your objective function in the sense of what is your objective that you would uh, consider as a success. So there would be different pa parameters, but probably in a, a human cases, uh, different objective functions could be set. So depending upon the student cohort, like maybe students that's at risk versus some other groups. So 
data can help to prioritize in setting weightage uh, that how do you use the data and what are the factors probably like from an engineering background that's what I felt like uh, like probably I, I can see it to be more mathematical oriented yes, yeah. problem but like if you interpret it with the context uh, it might have meaningful solution but any optimality conditions cannot have this absolute win against like particularly if they are constraints optimization like where conflicting uh, situations might be there so you have to like mathematics in mathematics we set boundaries like within this range I have to operate and out of that finite resources this is the best I can do and I will set my uh, performance objective accordingly to congratulate myself like if I have achieved this or there could be cases that the situation doesn't converge so I have to call it impossible to achieve. Sorry, probably didn't make any sense. No, 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 thank you very much. I mean, say, so again, one of the, the ways that data can be used is uh, prescriptively, where it can tell you what action to take and what action is likely to have a positive impact. So again, going back to our example, you have 200 at-risk students, you have time to contact 40, so then looking at your data model, you can identify the 40 students that your model will tell you who is most likely to benefit from the intervention. So then, allowing for the fact that your model might be wrong, do you ignore the other 160 students because their algorithm is slightly different? Bearing in mind that those are still 160 people doing 160 degrees with 160 sets of expectations and 160 set of hopes and 160 set of backgrounds. And do you just use the data then to to determine? Because that's, I, yeah, I, I, but, I wonder about that. That's a, the, the, but it should not be one size fits all. Absolutely, right? absolutely. Um, and I think that from the, the conversations that you guys have had today, if any message is very strongly coming through to me, it's that we have to avoid any sense of one size fits all. Yeah, I think some of this goes back to resilience as well. Um, that you can have equal opportunity, you could have equitable opportunity, but some of it has has to be from an institutional point of view that when the supports are there, the student still needs to come and avail of supports. Um, we did a, well, a DC run a study, and I'm overly familiar with it. Um, it was a master's by research student who looked at longitudinal data about student attendance and time spent in the library and how that mapped to grades. Um, and they ran a study then across a number of degrees where they asked students to check in in the library and check in for lectures. And then every week, literally sent them a graphic of a barometer so based on your current attendance and current time spent in the library, this is what grade you're going to get at the end. And that use of data for equitable rather than equal purposes. So if you avail of the services that are here for you, here's where you will end up. And they found that you know, mapped so closely based on time spent in the library and time spent in lectures. So I think some of it, you can provide all these services, but the data has to be used to show students that they need to avail of it in order to progress. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things in, in going around institutions, one of the things that we've seen again over and over again is often students don't, all of these resources are available and often students don't know what resources are available for them. As somebody used a fantastic phrase, um, you know, at the moment we tell them about everything in orientation. You know, if you're, if you're having financial problems, go to this, if you're having medical problems, go to that, if you're having psychosocial problems, go to that. But at that stage, you know, I've just come into college, I want to know what time the bar opens and I want to know whether I can get my elective module in such and such and who's your one. And, you know, as, as the phrase that somebody used is, at the moment we tell them what services are available just in case, not just in time. And I think that is potentially, that to me is the answer, that if we can use the data to find what resources would be helpful to what students and present them to them yeah. at the right time. 
what, what I find, and sorry, I don't mean to be a top two, what's just what I find is we would provide an awful lot of supports on this equality basis. So at certain times, you will offer all of these additional supports. And being frank, we might get um, student support involved, career service involved, and then four students show up. And then at other times, you spot a student who's in need, whether through just informal conversations or through the data that you see. And seeing that one student for a very short amount of time will give them the support they need, but you're not, the, like with limited resources, you're able to kind of just target at who needs it. So I think if the data can be used in, in that way, that we can spot, like you say, the just in time, rather than the just pump it out there on an institutional level three times a year when a student might have something else going on. I think that would go that way. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Never let it be said that I kept rude from people away from their coffee. So thank you all very, very much. Um, and, and thank you so much for your